A short primer on Frederick Kittler and Optical Media, Chapter 1. I'm going to be pulling from Kittler and the Media that was written by Jeffrey Rinthrop Young. It's an introduction to Kittler's thinking, also a little bit of his biography. Kittler is sometimes accused of being a techno-determinist. Techno-determinism is when one believes that technology drives social history. This is often the line that people point to when they make that argument. If media determine our situation, then it's not too much of a stretch to say media also determine history. So even though it might appear from this work that Kittler is advocating techno-determinism, I say let's hold on a little bit and look at this first chapter of Optical Media where Kittler lays out some of the fundamentals of his approach to media analysis. So Kittler here, right in the opening, says, I like McLuhan. I agree with McLuhan. What Kittler likes about McLuhan is that McLuhan draws attention to the technical sense of media studies and media analysis. In other words, that, that famous line, the medium is the message, says though what's most important here is the technological vehicle itself, the medium. But what Kittler takes issue with is that McLuhan attempted to think of media in terms of bodies instead of the other way around. In other words, McLuhan puts too much emphasis on the human being. There's a little bit of a, an anthropocentrism to McLuhan's work according to Kittler. In other words, the human being resides at the center. And again, the subtitle of Understanding Media is the extensions of of man. Media ultimately must be understood as the through the sensory organs and the sensory perceptions of human beings. Kittler, as much as you might esteem McLuhan's work, fundamentally disagrees with this approach to media and calls it at best tricky. How does technology evolve then? How do media advance? Well, not through human means. In fact, quote, the exact opposite suspicion arises that technical innovations following the model of military escalations, and we'll get back to Kittler's attachment to war here, only refer and answer to each other, which progresses completely independent of individual or even collective bodies of people. That's key. It's a, it's a little relative clause there, but it's a key clause. So let's go back to a slide from the McLuhan primer. This was a slide depicting the numbness that can arise when human beings don't recognize or take full account of their extensions in, with technology. Then this was McLuhan's hopeful vision that humans would strike an equilibrium with technology. For Kittler, it's all in the other direction. There is no equilibrium. Technology extends into us. Oh, so you say, well, wait a minute, let's go back. Look, he is a determinist. Media determine our situation. Technology extends into us. Technology determines the course of social history. Wait, hold on, let's not go there yet. To do technological histories or work in media analysis, you need to go beyond techno-determinism. It is more than simply human extensions. It is more than thinking about technology as simply mass media, television, radio, cinema. It is more than simply the invention, although Kittler is interested in how these technologies were invented in the early stages, he warns not to get too wrapped up into the cult of individual genius. Again, McLuhan believes that we interface with technology at the level of our senses, and we know our environment, therefore, through our senses, through technology. Kittler instead says we knew nothing about our senses until media provided models and metaphors for those senses. Technical media, he writes a little bit later, are models of the so-called human precisely because they were developed strategically to override the senses. So key words here are strategically and override. An example would be uh, that, that Kittler gives is 24 frames a second. Film was developed in order to trick our eye the rate of 24 films viewed every second creates the illusion of movement. This overrides our visual sense and we can no longer distinguish the single thing. This is coming to the news again lately with The Hobbit and the release at 48 frames per second. The act of watching a film at 48 frames a second is disconcerting. Cognitively speaking, we're used to our visual sense being tricked in a specific way. We're not used to it being overridden to this degree. The idea of technology overriding our senses and that driving development can be seen in Apple's recent marketing of its retina displays. Part of the campaign was that the human eye could not differentiate the individual pixels on the screen. It had, in a sense, superseded the capacities of our human organs. 
Therefore, for Kittler, technology and the senses operate on this adversarial level. They're enemies. The chapter proceeds after making this argument to talk about Greeks, Lacan, and war. And it's this last element, war, that I want to touch on. War for Kittler plays into technology in two ways, and I'm taking this from Winthrop Young. The first way is as a motor. In other words, war drives technological advancement, technological innovation, and technological investments. The other way is as a model. And just as war is adversarial, or to use a word from our discussion of Walter Ong, war is built on agonistic relationships, one group versus another group. Just as technology is in an agonistic relationship for Kittler with the senses, and technologies are in adversarial relationship with other technologies. We can go back to Apple again for another example. Its current relationship with both Google and Samsung continue to drive it forward. The chapter ends with Kittler's discussion of Claude Eldwood Shannon, specifically his general communication theory. Step number one, a data source generates a message. Two, one or more senders translate that message into signals. And there's going to have to be some concessions made in order to encode their signal in a way that fits the capacity of the channel that they're using. And three, that channel actually conveys the transmission. It moves the message from the sender to the receiver. And then when the receiver receives it, number four, it's decoded into a message. Five, that message gets put into a type of data sync. Now, if you look at this, if you look at this, these five steps, it's much different than another communication model, one that you might be more familiar with. That is the traditional triangle of sender, receiver, and message. And you can see the human being printed all over this. We see the human being as the receiver, as the sender, maybe perhaps even as the author of the message. But with Shannon's general theory of communication, the human possibly only comes in as a data sink, which isn't too attractive of a position to be in. Of course, I mean, a human being could be a receiver or of course could be a sender, but just so could a gramophone, a telephone, a typewriter, a television set. What is being stressed then is the technology. Kittler ends the chapter somewhat abruptly by saying Shannon's general theory of communication doesn't really cover storage, but perhaps storage isn't that important. And this ties into his thesis and his general approach to media. Storage brings us back to the importance of content, of connotation, of denotation, of what that message might mean. By throwing out the issue of storage, we focus completely on transmission. The message sent is never as important as the message that will come next.